This is Duke University. Uh, I want to welcome you to the 12th Lynn W. Day Distinguished Le Lectureship in Forest and Conservation History. This lectureship is sponsored by the Forest History Society, Duke University Department of History, and the Nicholas School of the Environment. I'm Jamie Lewis. I'm the staff historian at the Forest History Society. And I'd like to welcome, well, we hoped to be welcoming the uh, Duke Marine Lab down in Beaufort, but we understand that the entire island has been, has lost its internet connection. <laughs> so <laughs> there may be the island of <coughs> misfit toys or something, I don't know. Um, but regardless, for the web stream that others can watch, I want to thank the folks at Duke Video and Trinity Technology Services for setting all of this up and for exercising great patience with us uh, technophobes and, and neophytes. <clears throat> so first, a little housekeeping. Uh, I want to first welcome the Triangle Chapter of the Society of American Foresters. I've been asked to remind you that you're having a short business meeting today following the reception. Uh, the room number, or the room is just off of the hall downstairs the, where the reception is, and you'll be meeting in room 105B, and we can help you find that if need be. Uh, speaking of which, this lecture has been approved for one hour of CFE credit by the Society of American Foresters, and it qualifies for one credit towards the North Carolina Environmental Education Certification Program. If you're interested in the CFE credit hours, please make sure you sign the roster on the table at the, as you exit and pick up your certificate. Also, the Duke Student Chapter of the Society of American Foresters, there's a, obviously a strong SAF presence and interest here today. They would like to invite all to attend their fifth annual symposium, which will be next Friday at the Bryan Center. <coughs> this year's symposium topic is entitled From Research to Reality, Exploring How Biomass, Climate Change, and Forest Technology are Affecting the Forests of the Southeast. The event is open to the public, and it is free, as is the lunch that they will be serving. So those who believe that there is no free lunch are now wrong. Um, for more information and to register, and the only way to get the free lunch is to register in advance, please go to dukesaf.blogspot.com. I believe they also have some flyers up on the table as you exit regarding that and their annual Christmas tree sale. And speaking of free food, following today's lecture, you're invited to join us for a reception in the Hall of Science downstairs. On your way out, uh, as you go out, please pick up copies of our history magazine, Forest History Today. In fact, there are two different issues out there. But the next issue will be of great interest. Uh, it's due out next month, and it's all about today's topic, the Weeks Act. And it will feature an article by today's speaker. And now for the real reason we're here, besides the free food. The Lynn W. Day Distinguished Lectureship seeks to recognize a scholar or leader in natural resources that is shaping our understanding of human history and environmental change. In addition to recognizing evolving scholarship, the lectureships aim to be accessible to a broad audience on unique and provocative topics and philosophies. They all consider elements of the moral challenge of living sustainably on the earth. Videos of most of the previous lectures can be found on the Forest History Society's website at foresthistory.org. Now the lectureship was named for Lynn Warehouser Day, a longtime supporter of the Forest History Society. She was committed to forest conservation, environmental issues, human <coughs> welfare, and international development. She firmly believed that the lessons of history can help us ask better questions questions that will, in turn, lead to better decisions now and in the future. Now, many of you already know our speaker today, Dr. Bob Healy. Bob is Professor Emeritus of Environmental Policy here at the Nicholas School and, at the public pol and of Public Policy Studies at the Terry Sanford Institute. He asked me to explain the definition of emeritus. There seems to be a little confusion. It does not mean old in Latin. <laughs> But it actually, it means self-employed scholar who no longer has to be on committees or go to faculty meetings. 
His interests have focused on virtually all aspects of land use and land use policy, <coughs> urban growth and growth management, coastal zones, protected areas, agriculture, and of course, what brings us to, to him here today, forests. He is especially interested in the interface between environmental protection and local and regional economic development. He recently published a book on science and policymaking with MIT Press and has almost done another book on comparative environmental policy in Canada, Mexico, and the US. So apparently emeritus does, does not mean lazy either in Latin. Uh, he's perhaps more busy in, in quote unquote retirement than most of us are in our careers. Before coming to Duke in 1986, Bob worked for various resource and environmental think tanks in Washington, DC from 1970 till 1986, what he calls the golden age of environmental policy making. Since coming to Duke, he has been director of Duke's Center for International Studies and Center for North American Studies, and is a longtime member of Duke's Council on Latin American Studies. For six years, he was a board member of, of the Forest History Society, and we are deeply indebted to him for his time on that. As he will explain in his talk, Bob's nearly 40 years of interest in forests, though, began a bit later in life for him. Raised and educated in Los Angeles, he long thought that forests were simply the eucalyptus trees in his front yard and on the UCLA campus, where he earned his PhD in economics. Bob will be exploring themes that he first wrote about 34 years ago in his book, The Lands Nobody Wanted, Policy for National Forests in the Eastern United States. This book was co-authored by the late William Shands. The book explored the history and impact of the Weeks Act, one of the most important pieces of environmental legislation in our nation's history. As Bob is going to tell us, passage of the Weeks Act marked a change in federal land policy. This year being the centennial of the Weeks Act, we thought it would be ideal to have someone so familiar with the law and its impact revisit the subject and share his reflections on it. It is our honor to have Bob with us here today, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Bob Healy. <clears throat> well, thanks very much for uh, coming out. And uh, I want to thank the Forest History Society both for uh, having me uh, do this talk, but uh, also for providing me with a lot of the historical uh, images that you're going to see. And uh, if you don't know the Forest History Society, one of the many things they have to offer are over 10,000 uh, historical images on all aspects of uh, forest land, land use, water, uh, et cetera. And uh, they are very helpful in uh, uh, guiding you through this collection. And uh, I uh, really recommend that you get to, uh, to know them better if you have any interest at all in history. Um, this year is the 100th anniversary of the Weeks Act, and anniversaries generally call for both celebration and reflection. Uh, this afternoon I'm going to describe and celebrate the achievements of the Weeks Act, uh, and then I want to reflect on its implications for long-term policy making in a uncertain future. The Weeks Act was a monumental change in the attitude of the federal government toward owning land and in the benefits the society can expect from nationally owned forests. While the Weeks Act did some other things, uh, notably creating a federal state partnership for uh, fighting forest fires, it's best known for providing the legal basis and the financial means through which the Forest Service acquired 23 million acres of land in the Northeast, the Lake States, and the Southern US. These are now managed as 50 national forests and what I'm, uh, without what I'm going to uh, call the Eastern National Forests, the landscape of large parts of the United States from northern New Hampshire to western North Carolina to the Missouri Ozarks to central Florida to northern Minnesota would look and feel and function 
both economically and ecologically, far differently than they do today. The purpose of the Weeks Act, at least as stated in the legislation, and I'm going to elaborate on this, was to have the government buy and reforest cut over land with the goal of preventing floods from major rivers, like the one that devastated Pittsburgh in uh, 1907. It was a stunning reversal of land policy in the United States. For the first 120 years of the existence of the country, the United States had been divesting itself of its vast public domain, selling it, giving grants to build railroads, giving grants to states for schools and universities, uh, and promoting homesteading. When land was deemed too important to be in private hands, it was what they call reserved as national parks, uh, starting with Yellowstone in 1872, national monuments, Indian reservations, reserve mineral lands, and national forests. But since forest reservation only started in uh, 1891, and this was long after most land in the East had already been divested, the future national forest system was almost exclusively a Western one. Without the Weeks Act driving land purchases in the East, the Forest Service would be a Western-focused multiple-use agency, maybe not that much different from the Bureau of Land Management. So the Weeks Act, moving the government from divestiture to acquisition and giving it a major land base in the eastern half of the country as well as the west, was a truly monumental change in national policy. And it made the Forest Service a truly national land management agency. Besides being the 100th anniversary of the Weeks Act, this is uh, also the 34th anniversary of the publication of a book on the Eastern National Forests, uh, which I wrote along with the late forest policy analyst, Bill Shands. It was called The Lands Nobody Wanted, and uh, that refers to the fact that the Forest Service paid incredibly low prices for cut over and eroded land, and this reflected the fact that nobody else really wanted it. Let me start with a, a quick look at uh, what the Weeks Act uh, has done. Uh, between, after that, I want to ask the question, with the hindsight of a full hundred years, how can we judge the results of the implementation of this law? The Weeks Act went through two distinct periods of implementation. Um, between 1911 and 1931, the Forest Service spent, it varied from year to year, but between $1 million and $2 million a year uh, to buy a total of 4.9 million acres. It concentrated on buying land that was thought to contain damaged watersheds, as well as scenic and often very steep, i.e. mountains, in the western part of North Carolina, and in the White Mountains of New Hampshire and elsewhere in the Appalachians. Forest Service crews planted uh, tree seedlings, they aggressively controlled wildfire, and they applied the principles of what the time were considered good forest management. And you can see how this land uh, under the administration of the Forest Service substantially uh, recovered so many of its values. Now, in 1934 to 1936, the situation changed suddenly. Over three years, the Forest Service appropriation under the Weeks Act totaled $46 million, or double that of the previous 20 years. And land prices, driven down by both the Great Depression generally and the crisis in agriculture in particular made it possible for the Forest Service to buy more land for that amount of money. You can see in this map, uh, 
where they bought the land. And besides cutover forest land, they also bought marginal farmland. And the purchasing took place not just in the Appalachians and northern New England, but in a much broader area. <clears throat> the bulk of the land bought during the Depression was so worn out by cultivation, logging, and erosion that many considered it essentially worthless. It was the sort of land found all over Appalachia in the Piedmont South and the upper Midwest that pioneer soil conservationist Hugh Hammond Bennett often termed destroyed. Here's Bennett standing in a field and he gave a speech in 1934 in which he said that this land in a Piedmont County of South Carolina, quote, no one lives on this land. From the higher points, all the surrounding country was observed to be much the same, destroyed land, worn out and abandoned as far as the eye could see. Silence pervaded the landscape, desolation, irretrievable ruin. Man had laid bare the bosom of the earth to the wrath of the elements. Unfortunately, the rehabilitation of this land in all probability will require more than a thousand years. People don't write like this anymore. <laughs> sort of too bad. <clears throat> It was because of statements like this and many others made at the time that the Forest Service was uh, using the Weeks Act uh, to acquire the, what we call the land that nobody wanted. And I can, here's a, uh, uh, a little list, it's only a partial list, but uh, I think it's uh, pretty impressive. Uh, some of the prices that they paid uh, for land, big amounts of land, during the Great Depression. And now remember, wages were low, but the minimum wage was about $4 a day. And so if you had a job, you could actually buy the equivalent of more than one acre of land in some of these places. The trouble is, the land was uh, really in, in pretty grim shape. Um, <clears throat> Earlier this year, I visited the Talladega National Forest in Alabama, one of the places where land sold in the 1930s for two and three dollars an acre. I just wanted to see what this land uh, was like today. Some of the land was steep forest land cut over by a timber company and then abandoned. Other land, though, had been in farms. These were often mountain farms where lack of roads made access to markets and really to everything else, including schools, difficult. The soils were poor and the farmers were poorer. During the Depression, people were simply leaving everything and heading to northern or southern cities. Uh, I heard a story about one lady uh, from the eastern Alabama hill country by then a resident of a nursing home who got a check from the government for of $400 for the purchase of her farm. When she got the check, she said, well, I would have sold you that land for a candy bar. Uh, rehabilitation of this land and building of roads and other infrastructure was given a big boost by hundreds of thousands of young men that were employed by the Civilian Conservation Corps. Indeed, this was actually one of the reasons why Congress gave uh, the Forest Service this extra money was to buy land for the CCC people to have something to do. And in this case, uh, they are planting trees. <clears throat> so how can we judge the Weeks Act? Success or failure wise decision or foolish one. Um, one way to uh, judge success is to consider the government's expenditure as an investment. Uh, there's much discussion these days of the gov federal government making investments of various sorts. And as an economist, I describe an investment as an expenditure that is not just immediately useful something like forecasting hurricanes. Uh, but 
something that yields a continuing stream of income or benefits, things like medical research, improving education at all levels. An appropriate investment for government would also presumably be something unlikely to be done or done well by private capital. Now, historically speaking, the government has made some exceptionally good investments. One of our best was uh, buying Louisiana from Napoleon, who needed money at the time, uh, and things like agricultural research, which has had an amazing positive uh, return over more than 100 years. We've also made some pretty poor investments, like the large high-rise public housing projects of the 1950s, most of which have now been uh, torn down, and uh, uh, recent uh, investments in, uh, in solar energy. By 1942, when World War II effectively ended purchases under the Weeks Act, the federal government had bought a total of 19.1 million acres for $71 million, or especially given this cheap land in the Depression, only $3.72 an acre. So let's start with the most simple criterion uh, for success or failure uh, of an investment, the financial rate of return. And let's do a little thought experiment and see what would have happened if the government had not bought these lands, but instead had invested the money in something else. <clears throat> well, we're going to start in 1940. And uh, in 1940, the government purchased 500,000 acres of land for $4 an acre. So just for argument's sake, let's just assume that all of these forests, these 19 million acres were, in 1940, worth $4 an acre. Now let's assume that the government didn't keep these national forests, but instead invested that $4 in the stock market. In this case, the $4 per acre invested in 1940 would today be worth $344. Uh, what if the government more conservatively had invested in its own bonds? This is for 10-year treasuries uh, with the dividends reinvested. Uh, in this case, the return would be lower. Uh, each $4 acre of land would now be worth $106. Now, as somebody who has spent decades studying rural land, I can assert with some confidence that a price of rural land really doesn't exist. Uh, but we can offer some specific examples, and virtually all of them are worth much more than either $106 an acre or $344 an acre. I mean, just as an example, uh, let's look at Alabama's Talladega National Forest, the land that was not worth a candy bar in the 1930s. Today, the same land, which is now heavily forested and in many ways quite beautiful, would sell for about $2,000 an acre. In fact, a, a district ranger there told me that the descendants of the people who very eagerly sold this land to the government they are now grousing that the government in some way took advantage of you know, their grandparents. Actually, at the time, I've heard that locals thought the sellers were taking advantage of the government because this land was not even worth the, the little bit they paid for it. <clears throat> uh, the Eastern National Forests include areas of unusual scenic value. I think of the Blue Ridge Parkway through the Pisgah, Nantahala, and George Washington National Forests or the Appalachian Trail through the White Mountains, timber stands that are older and better managed than the average for their respective states. Uh, just to give another example, sites for recreational uh, homes, and these are for big lots. Near the first tract purchased under the Weeks Act in the Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina now sell for more than $10,000 an acre. And land adjacent to the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire uh, with views of the mountains 
can sell for equal or higher prices. Now remember, the Forest Service land is in the mountains, so it's even better views. I think that most people would consider either $106 or $344 an acre to be far, far below what the Eastern National Forests are worth in the market. So there can be little doubt, I think, that by buying the Weeks Act forests and hanging on to them for several decades, the government got a bargain. Or to put it another way, it made a good long-term investment. But market value, of course, is, isn't everything. Let's look at the recreational use of the Weeks Act land. A secondary consideration for passing the Weeks Act was the desire to promote outdoor recreation and tourism. The Weeks Act forests have fulfilled that promise, although as with watershed protection, the way in which the story actually played out was quite different from what was originally intended. I'll explain this in detail in a minute. Neither, nearly all of the Weeks Act forests have become destinations for a wide variety of recreational activities. And recreational visits in recent years have averaged about 45 million a year. The spread of automobile ownership and major improvements in roads beginning in the 1920s and quickening after World War II meant that these forests would not just be playgrounds for the wealthy who were expected to arrive by train, uh, but also would be among the nation's most important lands for mass outdoor recreation. Moreover, some of the types of recreation uh, that are pursued were unimaginable in 1910. The National Forests of New England in the upper Midwest received very heavy winter use by snowmobilers. Downhill skiing and snowboarding are popular wintertime activities. In fact, most of the ski resorts in the east are actually rented uh, from the, the Forest Service. Um, and in warmer months, visitors enjoy driving off-road vehicles and motorboats on the many artificial lakes created in these forests. And restoration of the national forests has led to a recent increase in uh, photography and wildlife viewing, and uh, these engage both local people and people who drive long distances to visit the forests. The Weeks Act also, uh, their forests contain 141 designated wilderness areas with a total acre, uh, acreage of 2.2 uh, million acres. And uh, by far the largest and, and one of the first and uh, really one of the, the most popular, uh, it was declared wilderness uh, in uh, as far back as 1964, is the Boundary Waters Canoe Wilderness in Minnesota. It's perhaps the most popular area in the entire country for long duration uh, canoe camping. Another wilderness uh, of note is the Joyce Kilmer Slick Rock Wilderness right here in North Carolina. Uh, it contains the Joyce Kilmer Memorial Forest. It's a 3,800-acre tract that was left uncut when loggers came through the area in the 1880s. It may be the only large area of old growth uh, in the whole eastern United States. Um, it has the largest and by some accounts the oldest uh, stands of oaks and sycamores and tulip poplars, uh, some of them reaching six feet in diameter or more. Now, not all of the Weeks Act uh, wilderness areas uh, are so inviting to human use. Some of them are swamp lands that uh, few people would really want to visit. But that just underlines a second fundamental reason for having wilderness. These are not just for recreation, but they give nature a chance to play out its many processes without the interference of humans. Now at the time of uh, the Weeks Act, a combination of habitat destruction and uncontrolled hunting had virtually wiped out game species of wildlife throughout the eastern United States. You may recognize a cartoon by the famous uh, Ding Darling from the 
the uh, Des Moines Register, the great cartoonist uh, of conservation in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, amazingly enough, uh, the white-tailed deer, which is eating our gardens and eating the Duke Forest, uh, was almost extinct in uh, states like Virginia and Alabama. In Alabama, uh, there I have read that uh, on the land that became Weeks Act Forest, there were about 20 white-tailed deer at the time it was purchased. Elsewhere, I've read that in the state of Virginia at about this time, there were about 20 white-tailed deer in the whole state. Hard to, to imagine. Uh, just three years after the Weeks Act, Congress passed the Lacey Act, which gave federal teeth to state hunting regulation and started the long process of bringing game management under the control of the states. <coughs> Uh, the restoration of commonly hunted species was not caused by the creation of the Eastern National Forest. They just weren't a big enough factor in the total landscape. But it was certainly aided by them. And many of the forests are now prime locations for hunting, as you can see uh, this trophy buck on the uh, Talladega. Eastern National Forests are also important for another kind of wildlife, the endangered and threatened species. These are much more numerous than the game species and often occur on very limited ranges. Some of them, like plants and insects and mussels, are highly endangered, but are generally seen only by scientists. The most, one of the most obvious endangered species, which is noticed and even sought out by many visitors, some of whom travel specifically to see them, is the red cockaded woodpecker. Uh, this bird uh, is a kind of specialist, and it nests in very old, 70 year plus, uh, longleaf pines, the sort of tree that under any normal system of forest management would have long ago been harvested. And this photo shows part of a large area of the Talladega National Forest where the Forest Service has restored cutover land to its original longleaf and then carefully marked and protected the nest trees that are used by the red cockaded woodpecker. With regard to the quantity and quality of trees on the Eastern National Forest, I would try your patience with all of the available statistics on species and sizes and locations. The overall story is one of aggressive replanting, both by the Forest Service crews and by the Civilian Conservation Corps. National forests that then, as the trees grew up, had a significant role in regional even and even national timber supply during the period 1945 to 1970 and then a slow pulling back from heavy cutting especially large clear cuts since 1970 in response to environmentalist objections and lawsuits and later legislation the only number that i'll offer with regard to this combination of planting and cutting and then easing off of cutting is the total volume of trees on the Eastern National Forest, which is considerable. Between 1953 and 2007, the total volume of trees on the Eastern National Forest increased by 162%. If you look at the private forests over the same period in the same region, timber volume only went up 17%. Now, what I'd, what I'd like to uh, show you, uh, just to give you an idea of how important these forests are to a host of users, uh, is uh, just a, a minute uh, from uh, a, uh, a celebration that was held in the White Mountains uh, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Weeks Act.
addition to the statistics I've given you, the, the public seems pretty happy. And uh, other celebrations actually were held in a number of places from uh, Texas to South Carolina to uh, Mississippi and Illinois. Now, at this point, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, our book and uh, the start of my long involvement as someone who works on forests. Uh, working on the book was my first assignment uh, at the Washington, D.C.-based Conservation Foundation, where I ultimately worked for 12 years. Uh, and I, I took this job after working for five years for two uh, downtown Washington uh, so-called think tanks. My specialty was land and land policy. But I had always thought of land in terms of urban sprawl and systems of cities, state land use policy, and a few thoughts about agriculture. I went to school at UCLA in uh, Los Angeles and Really, in my whole uh, graduate uh, career there, I literally never heard a mention, much less took a course uh, about forests and forestry. And as Jamie said, my idea of a forest was a eucalyptus grove in one corner of the campus and maybe the avocado tree in the backyard. <clears throat> so when I showed up to work at the Conservation Foundation and I was told that my first assignment was to uh, work with Bill Shands and write a book on forests, I was actually not very happy. And when I learned that my first day at work was a camping trip in Pennsylvania in late winter <laughs> with Bill and with uh, prominent Pennsylvania conservationist Art Smith, I was very unhappy indeed. I was ready to pack it up. Uh, <laughs> I had rather thought that the way one starts a new job at a think tank was filling up my desk and then finding the library and the copy machine and then wandering around the office in you know, a six-story office building in downtown Washington and starting to meet my colleagues. And here I was in a Pennsylvania forest trying to cook dinner while the sleet came down. Well, over the next three days, Bill and Art gave me a quick field introduction to forest ecology and forest management. And uh, the book and really subsequent work uh, helped me understand and value the Eastern National Forest. And uh, I have actually done as much work on forest as almost any other land related subject. Um, I got to see the fall colors of the Appalachians uh, I got to uh, learn about the various kinds of trees and like uh, this amazing longleaf pine in the so-called grass stage. Uh, and I was even fortunate enough on the Osceola National Forest in Florida to see a Florida panther. And uh, these are, there's about 20 left in the wild and the, the forest ranger I was with had not seen one in six years on that forest. But, you know, the, while forests are attractive, the real reason why forests have become a major focus of my professional life lies much more in the realm of economics and policy rather than in anything biological. One of the things that most intrigues me about forests as a, a land use <coughs> excuse me, is the idea of management of a stand of trees over a rotation. And a rotation is the period from the initial planting or natural regeneration of the tree uh, or the stand of trees to their final removal, often with interventions such as controlled burning, partial cutting, even fertilization that occurs at intervals in between. And a rotation is typically 30 to 70 years depending on location and species and the goals of the owner. So the length of a rotation means the, really the necessity for long-term planning. 
Now, this is always an issue in policy making in general, but when you deal with forests, it becomes very explicit. Timber companies have tended to use a fairly short rotation, but it's still about 30 years. The Forest Service has tended to use somewhat longer cutting cycles. When the Forest Service uh, did its great planning effort uh, for the nation's forests uh, in, starting in 1974, under the Renewable Resources Planning Act, they used a planning horizon of 50 years. But regardless of what planning horizon you choose, one thing is very clear. When you think about forests, you are thinking about the future and you are thinking very long term. So dealing with forests involves having some vision of the future, either quantitative or qualitative. And forecasting and long-term planning have occupied much of my career, including at Duke. Now the other interesting thing about forests <coughs> is that they are truly multiple use lands. And these uses compete through markets and through politics. So in thinking about forest policy, we have to think about future timber markets, but also about public recreational preferences, about human settlement patterns, about ecological change, about how members of the public think about that change, and the sometimes contentious set of issues dealing with how government-owned forests relate to the much larger and often intermingled land that is privately owned. The policy decision, how much wilderness should we have, has one foot in landscape ecology, but it has another foot in public preferences and political competition. So today we're looking back at a law that was passed 100 years ago and a book written about 35 years ago. And I'd like to take this opportunity to consider the Weeks Act experience and our own long ago book in terms of what history tells us about information and forecasting and foresight in policy making. Now the Weeks Act is almost universally considered a great success. Uh, I think that came through very strongly, uh, both in the evidence I gave and in the little clip of the celebration in New Hampshire. So given its evident success over 100 years on not just one or two, but on several important measures, evident 100 years after its passage, it would seem appropriate to call the framers and advocates of the Weeks Act things like clear thinking and farsighted. Well, I say this not to their discredit, but I think there's good arguments that they met neither of these standards. <clears throat> With regard to clarity of thought, uh, let's consider the act's stated purpose. It was to have the Secretary of Agriculture buy land within the watersheds of navigable streams to regulate them for navigation and it purported to be motivated by destructive floods on major rivers that affected large cities like Pittsburgh and the connection of this to extensive logging in their watersheds. Um, at the time of the Weeks Act, forests were seen as sort of sponges that soaked up rainfall during storms and then released it during the summer. So they would both minimize flood events and keep the rivers running in the summer. Well, in fact, in 1911, there was absolutely no scientific basis for this widely held view, which has sounded reasonable. And subsequent research would prove it mainly incorrect. Trees, and especially the organic layer that uh, builds up beneath them do indeed intercept and absorb rainwater. And they slow runoff, thereby decreasing water that goes into streams. But research would show that trees are thirsty for water through droughts, so they reduce rather than modulate 
stream flow in the summertime. And even the other part of the theory, that the trees would prevent disastrous floods, was not as simple as believed in 1910. Trees tend to work better to limit runoff from small streams than large rivers. And the effect depends on tree species, and planting grass can be just as effective as tree cover in absorbing rainfall. Uh, it's just a complicated story. Ironically, much of the research that would actually prove this and help us understand how watersheds work was undertaken on Forest Service experimental watersheds in places like the Hubbard Brook Forest, which is in the White Mountain National Forest, the Ferno Experimental Forest on the Monongahela National Forest, and the Coweta Forest on the Nantahala National Forest. So the stated premise for which the WEAK Act, today a very successful and popular law, was passed has proved scientifically pretty weak. Uh, but wait, the navigable waters claim actually was sort of a legal gambit. It was meant to satisfy the possible objection of a conservative Supreme Court that purchase of land for forests was uh, unconstitutional. And what they did was to say, well, navigation is clearly interstate commerce, so if forests affect navigation, then you can regulate them or buy them as part of interstate commerce. Uh, much of the support for government land purchase in the East actually came from two other sources. One of them was Gifford Pinchot's conviction that the country faced what he called a future timber famine, and only government could be relied on to manage the land wisely. And a second source of support came from local groups in western North Carolina and the White Mountains of New Hampshire that wanted forest land set aside and rehabilitated for recreation and scenery. Uh, so here is one part of the hidden agenda. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at these. Uh, first, consider uh, timber supply. <coughs> uh, Gifford Pinchot and his Forest Service and many independent experts uh, had observed a timber industry that had cut its way through old growth timber and then moved on. They certainly didn't practice uh, sustained yield forestry as was done in Germany and France. Uh, by 1911, the industry had cut through New England and the Appalachians and the Lake States and was now in the lower south, cutting wastefully and with little thought for regeneration. Uh, Gifford Pinchot, uh, believed that only government could put America's forests under the kind of sustainable long-term management that was needed to avoid what he feared would be a future timber famine. Now linked to this concern was also a possible shortage of timberland itself. In 1900, Raphael Zahn, who was a distinguished economist with the Department of Agriculture, <coughs> excuse me, wrote that there is little doubt that our population in the next 50 years will reach at least 150,000. Uh, now, actually, he was a pretty good guess because by 1950, uh, we had 100, excuse me, 150 million, and by 1950, we had 152 million. So his population forecast was right on. But he also said that to feed these people, we needed to increase farmland from the then current 21% to 50% of all the land in the US. And since there wasn't much farmland in the arid west, this meant essentially clearing everything but the mountain peaks uh, in the east. Well, he was right on population. He was very wrong on cropland. In fact, by 1950, uh, cropland was actually a little bit less than it was in 1900. Well, what happened? Well, what happened was that the internal combustion engine, the tractor and the combine, replaced horses and mules. 
This not only made labor more productive, but something that people often don't think about was that this released tens of millions of acres of land that was feeding the horses and mules and made that available for crop production. It's called the first revolution in productivity revolution in American agriculture, the second being hybrid seeds. Um, and this would cause a massive movement of people, mostly poor people, uh, off of the land. And moreover, Pincher was wrong about something else. Even before the large timber companies had finished cutting the old growth of the South, they had started to practice some rudimentary forestry on their land. The expected timber famine never materialized. Now the second hidden motivation of the Weeks Act was the demand of organizations in, the, in Western North Carolina and in New Hampshire for restoration of mountain lands for scenic views associated with outdoor recreation and tourism. Now their view of outdoor recreation was sort of go by rail to a big hotel and then hike in this beautiful place. It wasn't the kind of mass uh, outdoor recreation that we have become used to since then. Uh, the interstate highway system changed remote to accessible. And changing tastes made activities like camping and hiking and wildlife viewing something for the masses, not just for the elites. And then, <coughs> by the 1960s, a demand for wilderness that would have astounded early advocates of forest recreation became evident. And the protection of wildlife extended not just to the viewable and huntable species, but to plants and insects and vertebrates of other life forms whose protection came not from human use, but from a whole new idea, and that is the protection of biodiversity. So to sum up, the Weeks Act didn't do much for its stated goal, the protection of navigable waters, but and it had a much more complex relation than anticipated in timber supply and recreation. But as I outlined above, it's regarded on many levels as a great success. So was the success outlined above a matter of just blind luck or something other than like vision and foresight? What might we learn from the Weeks Act about the role of our expectations about the future in making important changes in present day policy? Now, many of you uh, reading about the uh, <coughs> financial crisis of the last three years had become familiar with the term black swan event. It was coined by business professor and securities analyst Nelson Taleb, and it refers to the impossible situation or event that makes ordinary projections of risk analysis just wrong. Uh, it comes from this idea, as he writes, people in the old world were convinced that all swans were white, an undeniable belief because it seemed to be conserved confirmed by hundreds of years of empirical observation in Europe and North America. Swans were white. Well, then Australia was discovered where the swans are black. And so the financial crisis caught smart people using the most elaborate models of risk and techniques of risk management as a complete surprise. Like the black swans of Australia, it was simply outside their ability to anticipate or even imagine. We also have uh, something that's been termed neon swan events. And these are things that uh, are, quote, unthinkably rare, immensely important, and blindingly obvious, except they are very far into the future. They're too far to really motivate much action or concern. Uh, you think of things like the ultimate population of the Earth uh, and some of the extreme impacts of climate change as, as being neon swans. They're, we, we sort of pretty sure they're going to happen, but they're so far away we just put them off. Um, 
Now, I suspect actually that many of the present neon swans will turn out to be black swans in disguise. Um, <coughs> I'm going over, but I, I want about 10 more minutes to, 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 to lay this out if you don't mind. Uh, the fact is that looking into the future, whether long term or short term, is really difficult. Uh, this is an amazing study. Political psychologist Philip Tetlock followed the predictions of 284 experts on political or economic trends. These are prominent export experts, the kind of talking heads you see on TV. Over a period of several years, he asked them questions and collected a total of over 27,000 predictions about the future. The result, the experts fared about as well as a roll of the dice. Uh, political scientist Bill Asher looked at whether expert predictions of specific things like population, uh, the level of GNP, energy demand, had improved over the period of 50 years. Uh, as we accumulated knowledge and as we got more complicated, sophisticated models, they weren't. And he also found that Alternative models tended to make the same errors because they all relied on certain core assumptions, some of which turned out to be very wrong. So it's very hard to forecast the future. There's ordinary statistical variation, but even more important, those big black swans keep flying in. So let me look briefly at some of the black swans that were encountered on the Eastern National, looking at the Eastern National Forest, uh, both by Weeks and by Bill Shands and I. <clears throat> In trying to deal with the future, I, uh, when Weeks and the people supporting the law, including Pinchot, uh, looked at what the future, you know, what they had to deal with in the future, they, they looked at things like the need to rehabilitate watershed, the need to protect game species for hunting, modest recreational demand for these most scenic areas like the White Mountains, and Pinchot's timber famine. Well, all right, so what actually happened? One of the things was that the companies started to manage their forests. They ran out of land with old growth timber, and there also were a couple of discoveries that made southern totally changed the economics of southern forestry. One in 1914 was the discovery you could make craft paper. That's what goes into boxes and, the, and uh, uh, bags from the store, the heavy brown paper. And then in 1934, the discovery you could make, uh, use southern pines to uh, uh, make newsprint. Both of these created a gigantic paper industry but they also meant that you could cut little trees as you went along in the rotation. You didn't have to wait 30 years. You could get income and make a lot of money as you went along, which gave them an incentive to plant large acreages of forests. There also was not just elite recreation, but mass recreation based on the automobile going to lots of places different from what originally had been envisioned. There was, now Pinchot had this vision of good management that was essentially a plant of monoculture, nurture it, protect it from fire, and then clear cut it. Well, by the 60s, environmentalists were objecting to this. And again, something that was just unthinkable. Uh, at the time of the Weeks Act. The idea that we had endangered species, there were all these little critters, like the mussels and the insects and the plants. Again, uh, maybe a few scientists thought of this in 1911, but this was just not part of the debate about forest management. And finally, the demand for wilderness. Who in the world would want to go to a wilderness? That was ridiculous. Now we have 141 on these very Weeks Act forests. Well, let's see what Bill and I did. Uh, 
we were pretty right about things like uh, biodiversity corridors, about non-farm rural settlement, about the fact that you'd have uh, wood imported from places like Canada and South America, although we never would have thought that the volume would be as high as it, it was. But for us, there were surprises too. Global climate change. In 1977, if you worried about global climate change at all, you worried about global cooling rather than global warming. The divestiture of industry land. We thought these companies like International Paper, they had this land, mills, they were to keep it forever, and then all of a sudden they sold it, some for development, but a lot to various syndicates of investors who essentially had a 10-year time horizon, very different from uh, what industry was doing. Telecommuting for the masses uh, with the internet. We have no idea what this is gonna mean for our urban settlement patterns. And then finally, the changing composition of the US population, the tremendous increase in the number of Hispanics, and we don't even know what their ultimate desire and the desire of their kids are gonna be for various kinds of outdoor recreation. The fact is that there are lots and lots of surprises. So what do we do when so many of our expectations of the future and our carefully constructed models appear to be not just a little off the mark, but dead wrong? How do we make good policy? And does the history of the Weeks Act offer any useful lessons. But what I've learned in reconsidering the Weeks Act, um, and I was actually surprised by this, but you don't have to be right about the future to make good policy. In fact, you can encounter whole flocks of black swans and still have a successful outcome. So what follows is a, a set of observations. I don't want to call them guidelines, but they're observations about some specific things the Weeks Act did that might help us think about long-term policy making in a somewhat different context. The first one is <coughs> that I think there is a role for government in managing for the future, for investing. Uh, the private market is a wonderful thing but its time horizon is measured in quarters and years and rarely in decades. Only governments and maybe some nonprofits like universities and foundations and land trusts can deal with these neon swan events. And I can't say that only government can help us deal with the unknowable black swans. By definition, they're surprises but governments tend to manage their land pretty conservatively and keep options open, and they're slow to respond to the fad of the moment. In the case of the Weeks Act, this has offered the flexibility that helped us deal with a whole series of black swan events, including the Great Depression. Um, second, the Weeks Act didn't substitute government for the private sector but rather it created a situation where government and private lands were mixed, with private land almost always dominant. Gifford Pinchot was incorrect when he asserted that government ownership was necessary to good forest management. But I think he was correct in believing that government could set an example for the other owners. When the cut and run era of the forest products industry was over, firms started to buy and hold and manage a permanent land base. And in the lands nobody wanted, one of our recommendations was that the Eastern National Forest should do exactly the opposite of what everybody else is doing. So in their first 30 or 40 years, they were practicing this sustained yield forestry. Eventually, the industry and private owners started to do the same thing and at about that very time, Eastern National Forest moved much more toward a ecological model of multi-resource management with timber as being a, almost a tool 
of ecological uh, management. Uh, and I think now as we face the issue of climate change, there may well be a particular role for these eastern national forests as sort of role models for and experimental places uh, in a context of predominantly private ownership of forest land. And the third thing that I think was <coughs> important was that the Weeks Act put management of the forests that were to be acquired in the hands of uh, a strong but flexible agency, the U.S. Forest Service. Um, I'll say without apology that the Forest Service is one of my very favorite federal agencies. It started with a very clear mission, heavily influenced by the articulate and charismatic founder, Gifford Pinchot, and it's for decades been a multiple use agency and one that was accustomed to balancing uses against one another. It has long uh, had close ties to the profession of forestry and has had a major research component. Now, many of you will be amused if I, that I've called this agency flexible because in many ways they're very stubborn. But I think they're stubborn in the short run. But in the long run, they have been responsive. It took a long time, but over the last 30 years, uh, they have really changed in response to public and congressional pressure. 30 years ago, every national forest had a timber program and every forest service chief was a forester. Today, the industry has a strong orientation toward ecological restoration. The chief can be an ecologist and timber production is a distinctly secondary activity on many of the forests. The content of its research and the background of many of its employees have changed. This is an agency that doesn't bend in passing breezes or maybe hurricanes, but is capable of major changes in slow, deliberate steps. Just a, a couple more observations. Um, the Eastern National Forests from the start had a broad and often contending set of constituencies. Uh, there were local governments that wanted revenue from the forests. The forestry profession represented by Pinchot and the uh, uh, employees of the Forest Service um, that wanted a sustained yield forestry program. The forest products industry that wanted a reliable source of fiber for its mills. The recreation industry and the pro-environment lobby. None of these interests was strong enough to capture the agency. That's always been the problem with federal agencies. There's one or two interests that tend to capture them over time, especially when you're talking about 100 years. So they couldn't capture the agency, but all of them granted its legitimacy as the place where decisions were made. And so the fourth point is, by centering management on the Forest Service and the various subsequent laws that governed it, like the Eastern Wilderness Act, the National Forest Management Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Weeks Act created a single forum through which these interests could work out their differences. Through political action, through trying to persuade congressional committees, through planning processes, through public hearings, even through quite a lot of lawsuits. The battles have been fierce, but it was always possible to identify the issues and the players and the arena. And I might note that the diversity of interest that characterizes issues today, like healthcare policy and energy policy, really suffers from the lack of a single uh, arena in which these various strong constituencies can work out their differences, but where ultimately the agency provides resolution and implementation, if only until the next battle. And finally, uh, and what I think is the most important lesson of all of the Weeks Act, uh, is that it shows in a time of timidity and cynicism and indeed, uh, I think, a certain scorn about the role of government in society. And at a time of pervasive worry about the future, 
that there can be great public policies. And these policies have repercussions through decades and generations and now for a century. So happy birthday, happy 100th birthday, Weeks Act. Happy birthday, Eastern National Forests. And thanks for your attention. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.